Good afternoon and good evening everyone to all our uh, attendees from around the world. It's great to have you all with us today to the last of our ARC Blue Water Preparation Seminars. It's really great to have the team from North Sales with us today. Uh, Bob, Neil and Jeremy are going to be talking to you about various aspects to do with uh, sales, downwind sales particularly, but they'll be touching on some other areas of sales for cruising boats. They'll be sharing their extensive knowledge, knowledge with you and they'll be answering your many questions, I'm sure, about all things to do with sales. So really good to have you guys with us again. Um, I will hand over to you, Bob, who you can introduce the team and talk a bit more. So I'm going to jump out of the room now and um, be hiding in the background. So thank you very much. Over to you, Bob. I just want one more. We're at 99. We've got to get you. <laughs> all right, well, there. there's a comment. There's a few, few folk coming in late. So don't worry about that. We'll get there, I'm sure. Uh, well, my name is Bob Mahar. I work for North Sales in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, I've been uh, lucky enough to play with sailboats now for going on 20 years, uh, which will make at least uh, one of the people I know who's in the room here uh, feel even older because uh, he helped train me. Uh, but uh, it's been a great ride. Um, a lot of my concentration, uh, uh, both a while ago and currently, uh, ended up in these really weird looking boats called cruising multi-hulls uh, that have dominated the cruising industry and are, I still believe the fastest growing segment uh, of the whole thing. I've been lucky enough to be on all sorts of different types uh, and uh, still get to play with, uh, with, the, with pointy monohulls from time to time too, which is, which is always fun. Um, anyway, uh, that's just a, a little bit about me. Um, I'm joined by Jeremy. Jeremy Smart, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I've been working for North Sales for over 20 years now. Uh, in that time, I've been lucky enough to deal with all sorts of uh, different boats and supplier sales for um, many different needs. And including in Monks, that lot, a lot of um, boats have gone on to do the Ark and, and around the world voyages. So good experience of uh, equipping boats for trade wind sailing. Uh, my own experience of sailing, uh, irrelevant to this talk, I did cross the Atlantic uh, back in 1997 on an Ocean 71, a very sort of seaworthy, seaworthy vessel, uh, which, was a, which was a lovely experience. Uh, I haven't repeated it since, although I would like to, just not had the time yet. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I hope to one day get across the Atlantic again. But what I'm doing at the moment is um, supplying a lot of sales people that are going to go and do this lovely voyage. Mm -hmm. And uh, now over to my colleague, Neil. Good evening. Um, I'm sort of the old boy of this lot because uh, this year I'll be celebrating 40 years of North Sales. So nice. um, it's been a, <clears throat> a pretty epic trip. Um, <clears throat> when I first started there, laminates didn't exist. Everything was woven Dacron. So from there through to where we are now, I've seen a, a massive change in, in the industry. Um, I started on the loft floor. Um, I then ran the service department then into sales and ever since I've been uh, in sales. Sailing wise, done, you name it, I've sort of done it. A little bit of multi-hull, a little bit of high performance multi-hull. Um, I sell a lot of sales to Oyster and to Swan. So get very heavily involved with those boats, which obviously a lot of them go across, do the round the world rallies or transatlantic rally or just general cruising. So have a very good idea of what those boats need and what people like to use and how easy and bad they are to use. Um, from a racing point of view, I know there's no racing here, but I'm one of the few people that won the Fastnet ra race twice. Um, Middle Sea race, Duralia, all sorts of long offshore races. So quite a bit of offshore racing experience. I still, like Jeremy, not done transatlantic, always too busy. It's a busy time of year from a selling point of view so um it's very difficult to get across in october november december but i will one day excellent so well everyone we have uh, developed a, a presentation here that we're going to try and keep pretty free flowing it, it concentrates largely on downwind sales because we understand uh the, <laughs> the general winds that you're going to experience in the atlantic arc anyway uh, we will touch on other things, and of course, we're open for questions the whole time. Uh, so I'll just start sharing the screen. Uh, there's contact info for us if you've got questions later. This will be at the end of the slideshow as well. Uh, so 
uh, you will see this again. Uh, first, a little bit about North Sales. Um, while it's nice to say we're the biggest, what it means to you is we have more service locations in different parts of the world than any other sailmate. So as you are preparing for different voyages, chances are the place you're doing the work to get your boat ready has a North Sales law. If not, there's probably one close by. The other nice thing is we all communicate. We've largely got access to all the same information about you, know, you and your sales. And if we don't have it in the computer, we talk a lot. So we're an integrated network here uh, to help you enjoy your boats more, uh, to, to keep it fun and to keep it safe. Uh, most specifically, as you're looking for an ARC rally, uh, a lot of the people's last stops will be in Spain uh, or uh, in, of course, the Canaries on the way out. We've got facilities there. And then when you get to the Caribbean, of course, uh, we've got a, a number of places uh, when you're there where if stuff happened along the way, uh, you can get it tuned up, repaired, uh, or start working on replacements if things went really bad like that. Hopefully that doesn't happen to you. So we're well positioned to help and we're well motivated to help because we get to help people enjoy their boats and it's a fun job. So uh, that's what we're all about. Um, Jeremy, you've done this and, uh, You've got a couple of nice little stories there. Uh, trade wind sailing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Tell us about um, it. And also important to mention on those lofts, um, they're a good point. The ones in Europe, all those lofts can accept, you know, if you want to have pick up a new sail before going across, all new, you know, new sails can be delivered to those locations, Valencia, uh, Palma, Lanzarote. You know, you can pick up, you know, you have your new sail delivered there and pick it up before going across if that's, um, that's an option as well. We should caution everyone, uh, just like so many other aspects of society these days, combination of high demand, supply chain, uh, and just a lot of people buying toys. Uh, it takes a while to get a sale now from anybody. Plan further ahead than you think, please. Yeah, good point. Probably need at least four or five months these days. Yeah. So, trade wind sailing. So, trade wind sailing is what we're going to talk about mainly tonight, which... Um, you hope it's uh, going downwind in um, in nice sunny conditions without too much wind. It's not always like that, obviously. Sometimes you can get nasty. You know, some big squalls come through, and it can get a bit get a bit rough. But these sort of um, images here sort of bring together what you're what we're sort of aiming for: a bit of fishing, downwind sailing, relaxing, and hopefully getting to the Caribbean and having some nice cocktails on the beach at the end of it. Um, Obviously, people have been going doing these trade wind routes for for many many years um, in these sort of lovely uh, lovely conditions, but you need to make sure your boat is um, is ready to take everything because you're not quite sure it's always going to be like in those photos. So before we get onto downwind sailing, these are sort of the essential sails that you're going to want to make sure your boat is set up for. Um, in order to sort of safely do these long passages. So in, in my mind, you want a good quality mainsail that you can reef heavily if you have to. Um, I mean, we'll talk about a bit about sail cloths later, but so these just needs to be a good quality, durable cruising spec. So either Dacron, uh, triradial cut, cruising laminate, um, 3DI, something that's really tough, durable and, and high spec cruising sail. Uh, that's going to be able to take, you know, a fair bit of abuse if it has to. So heavily reefing mainsail, ideally three reefs or two deep reefs. If you haven't got three reefs in your um, in your sail, is a is a good idea just so you can get the sail away. Um, if you haven't got that, then a tri sail is another good another good um, sail to have on board in case you know you get damage to your mainsail. And then as with the mainsail, you need a very durable, good quality head sail. Uh, that goes without saying. Um, and ideally, I think a storm jib is a good idea on these ocean passages. Something in the perfect world, you'd have that on an independent stay. So a stay which isn't part of the main force stay in, in order to be able to hoist it easily without having to drop your fold up Genoa. So that, that's the ideal scenario. I know it's not quite always like that with storm jibs, but um, if you can, I would get an independent stay and have your storm jib there ready to go. Neil, you have some on a storm jib? Not so much on the storm jib, but I've got a question here from David Carley. 
who's taking delivery of a Beneteau 46.1 any day. He's got a standard main and jib, but his recommendations on the process of selecting an additional headsail and a choice for downwind sail, especially for long passages. So that probably just falls into this category here a little bit as a discussion point to um, Bob and Jeremy. We'll certainly get to the downwind sailing part of this uh, later in the thing, I mean, um, like that. If the boat's already got the standard maiden jib, it, it, it sounds like needs to make sure that the reefs are in the right place to either add one uh, or, um, or not. Um, it's probably a good time to roll into Ellen's question. Yeah, it, it, it can be tricky setting up a storm jib uh, on the boats sometimes. And I know ATN, based here in Fort Lauderdale, um, does produce a, a, a system that wraps around a furled Genoa, a furled headsail, and hoists up around it once the sheets are kind of taken out of play by, by spiraling it. What do you guys think of sailing like that? Um, I've actually used one of these a little bit in anger. And I have to say that once it was fully hoisted, it was great. But the, the rigging up and the setting up of it was an absolute nightmare. And unfortunately, we did it early enough that it wasn't too rough. But if we'd left it another half hour or an hour, then I think it would probably have been impossible to have done. You basically, you've got this fabric that wraps around your furled up Genoa. So the first thing you have to do is furl away the jib, furl away all the jib sheets so that there's no jib sheets hanging down. They have to be at the tack of the sail. And then you start wrapping this fabric around and clipping it back on itself and hoisting the sail. Um, one, when it was sliding over the, the sail that is underneath, obviously that's not a smooth surface, so it's not ideal. Um, and it, if, to be honest, it was a bit of a fight. And if you were doing it in a seaway, it would also potentially be dangerous. But for some people, it is the only solution. So if you are going to go with something like that, make sure it's up in the air early, as opposed to leaving it too late and not being able to set it. Great. So, uh, as you turn and go downwind, uh, there are a number of options. Uh, and the, the simplest, of course, is with the sails that, that we just talked about. Um, the obviously pulling the Genoa out with a whisker pole uh, or, or a spinnaker pole out to windward and letting the main uh, hangouts allured uh, is, is something anybody can try. Uh, it takes a little bit of setup, I believe. Um, but what's involved in that, Jeremy? Yeah, so, I mean, maybe just flick back to that, that earlier slide, Bob, if you can. Um, so here you're seeing two, you're seeing um, two different boats with, you know, pulling out um, their head sail. One thing to look at, I was just thinking back to the, the question we just had on the Q&A about the 46.1, just looking on the internet, whether that's got a self-tacking jib or, a, or a, um, an overlapping, not an overlapping, but a 105% jib, it's hard to tell. But the one problem with the self-tacking jibs are not going to pull out as nicely as these two cells in these pictures are because these are sort of overlapping or you know full-size genoas. Um, with relatively high clue, they pull out very nicely going downwind. Um, it's not always the same with every sail on the boat. So if you've got a standard sail straight from the straight from you know the, the yard with a new boat, uh, a self tacking jib, it might well be not as easy to pull out as um, as these sails are here. So just something to think about. In which case, a dedicated downwind sail would probably be a good idea to look into. Um, but this sort of setup here is, is what a lot of people do um, who do the art, you know, um, it's a very sort of safe, secure setup. It's easy to reduce the sail area because you've got the head sail on the furler. You can just furl it away to, you know, to reduce your sail area and, um, and make things a bit more safe or a bit more uh, secure at night. It's very easy to drop that area away. What it is a bit... Um, limited on if it goes a bit lighter winds you obviously haven't got that much sail area in this configuration so having some sort of extra sails which we go into in a minute um give that boat a bit more power and sort of reduce the passage time drastically and another thing uh, looking at you know, talking to people who've done this setup across the um the arc and other other similar long passages you really need to practice it a little bit before you um do it on the main trip just to make sure you've got all the sheets, guys, and um, and stays 
working properly in order really to stop the pole bouncing around too much. Um, and also that in that way, also reducing the chafe from the, the sheets and guys, because that can be quite a factor on a long passage, you know, just with all these sheets and guys on the pole end just chafing away. Great. OK, uh, I think the important thing there is practice, because making sure the pole length is the right length in relation to the LP of the Genoa or when you have to roll the sail partially or something else. Uh, it's all pretty straightforward to figure out uh, when everything's nice and calm and uh, and you can take your time. Yeah, I think this ne this next slide here shows it quite nicely. Um, this is on a colleague of ours, Warwick Kerr's boat when he crossed the Atlantic a few years back. Um, and he's got a nice sort of setup there with the pole. It's not really bouncing at all, but he took a little bit of you know playing around with to get that to get that set up like that. You can see he's got a fair bit of roll on there, but the pole is nice and firm and not really sort of um, moving around at all, which is what you'd be looking to see. So he's got a downhill on there, a nice sort of stay either way, and he's got it really locked in. You also notice in that picture, what he has got, I think it's probably more to do with getting the sail the right length for the pole, but he's got a little bit of a reef in on that head sail. Um, and I think that's because this is an overlapping genera. It just makes it better for um, fitting his pole length. Nice. Cool. Just one thing on that picture where, where you can see the boat rolling quite a lot. Um, that is basically caused because you've got a, what is two genos out in front of the boat and also a mainsail. And it's the misbalance of the mainsail sitting there that is causing the boat to roll around. So I often find that the comfiest way downwind is, is with the twin headsails and no mainsail. Um, and you basically just drop the mainsail, save the wear and tear on the mainsail against the rigging and just use the two headsails. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a good uh, setup. Um, and actually, or maybe just flip back to that side one more time, the downwind one, because what it does show as well, when he's rolling around and you look up at the mainsail, being a sailmaker, this guy, he knows how to protect his sail and he's put some really good full length spreader patches on his um on his main sail which i think when it zooms up in a minute uh you'll see so yeah that in that area there you can see on the spreader he's got a full length um spreader patch there which is in perfect mm -hmm. position and that's just preventing chafe because doing something a long passage you know a few thousand miles there's a lot of chafe from the spreaders and the rigging on the sail. So we're just sort of bringing that up from this point here, um, just to sort of show you the wear points really. So that the, the wear on the sail, where the spreader patches are, is, is, a, is gonna be a big factor. And looking at these pictures here, obviously the top right, they've got spreader patches on, they're probably not in exactly the right spot because the um, it's not fully covering the end of the spreader. So make sure they're in the right location um, and they're, full length is a good idea. And then you can see different ways people have, you know, made up to try and protect the sail. You know, if it's wrapping uh, duct tape and insulation around your spreaders, doesn't look great, but it's um, it's gonna save the sail a bit on a long voyage. You yeah, know, wrapping leather around the ends of the spreaders also, or some sort of other, um, some sort of other protection is also a good idea as well. Great. Okay, now, the next option is one that North Sales calls a trade wind sale. Um, this is uh, kind of outside the norm uh, when it comes to North Sales. Uh, Neil or Jeremy, which of you have sailed this the most? Probably me, I would have thought. Um, I don't know, Jeremy. I've done, a, I've done a, not a long trip in one, but I've used one you know, a few times. Um, and I've spoken to customers that have used them, but you've used them a bit on some of the oysters you've done, haven't you? Yeah, I've done, I've done quite a few of them on, on the oysters and, it, and it's quite interesting. Initially, you know, most people would see this as a small boat setup. Um, more recently, I've done it on an Oyster 625, um, an Oyster 595 and a 565. So the boats are definitely getting bigger. Um, I think that's through the sort of the advent of having better furling cables to allow the sails to furl and unfurl better. Um, up until recently, you know, they weren't available for the, for the big sails, but now you can put a proper torsion cable in there as opposed to a furling rope and, and 
they work, work a treat. Describe it a little more. What makes it different? Um, the, the biggest difference, so in my mind, I call it a, a torsion cable. And a torsion cable is a cable, want for a better word of it, that is designed to be more torsionally stiff than it is actually strong. Where is that in this sail? And it's in, in a luff tube that joins the two sails together. So this is really two sails in one. Two sails in one with a tube going up the middle. And inside that tube is, is the furling cable or furling rope, depending on what you've got in there, depending on the size of the boat. You're typically, if it's under, I would say, 40, 45 feet, you'll get away with the, the torsion rope. If it's over 45 feet, then I would strongly recommend, and although they're expensive, a proper torsion cable, because it's the torsion in the rope that basically makes the sail either work or not work. So the torsion ropes are generally good to about 15, 18 meters. And that means that when you turn the furling drum at the bottom, the top of it will respond at a similar rate. As soon as you move into a torsion cable, then if you had a 20 meter length laid out on the loft floor and one person grabbed one end and one person grabbed the other, if someone put half a turn in it, you would see half a turn at the other end almost instantly. So the, the furling effect and the torsion within that cable is way, way, way more responsive than what it is in the torsion rope. And, and that is the critical thing on the, the bigger boats. So we're seeing here essentially it looks like two sails that are joined on the luff uh, and flown as one uh, spread out in this case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what wind angles is this sail useful in? Um, it's, it's quite an interesting one, actually. I, I did an experiment on the Oyster 595 and we got to about 160, 165 true. Um, I always deal in true wind angle downwind just because it's more realistic. It allows you to know when you can and can't set it because the apparent wind is always changing depending on sea state and how fast you're going. But um, yeah, I was quite surprised. 165 was still very comfortable, which is sort of an interesting one because that's the bottom end of where you'll get to with a, a Jenica. You know, mm -hmm. Typically, a Jenica is 125 to 160, 165, and you can't go any deeper. And if you're wanting to go down the old 180 freeway, which a lot of you will be doing when you're going across the Atlantic or the Pacific, then um, that's where the trade wind sail really kicks back in and, and allows you to sail a shorter distance, be it at a slower speed. But at least you're cutting the corner on people who are having to sail 155, 160, maybe even higher if it's light airs. One thing also, I would say on these sails as well, um, just looking at that middle picture in this image here of the, the lady on the foredeck on her beanbag, that's the wife of the, um, the chap who, used to, who sort of invented this sail really in um, North Sales, New Zealand. And um, she was saying that this sail really reduces the roll in the boat. Because as you can see, looking at the air, shape of the sail there, all the area is very low down. So the main, the main bulk of the area is low down and that, really helps with reducing roll compared to a spinnaker or a big jenica where the area is a bit higher up uh, so nice sort of stable so she was saying she likes to go on the foredeck on the bean bag sit down there and it's, she loves the sail because the whole, whole boat is much more uh, much more stable and easy to, easy to use when this sails up and another thing with this sail compared to pulled out head sails twin head sails pulled out obviously you're gaining a lot of area you've got bigger area with these nylon sails and also a lot lighter weight so it sets in a lot less wind. So not all of these, you know, um, ocean pastures are that windy, you know, particularly the crossing the Pacific or something like that, generally a bit lighter than the uh, Atlantic. And then this sort of sail is gonna set a lot nicer than pulled out twin head sails will do. Now, what are we seeing in the right photo? Yes, so in the right, sir, in the right hand photo there, you'll see the, the multi-purpose part of the sail. So you can have it, splayed out in trade wind mode 
uh, as in the other two photos on the left, uh, where you got one cell pulled out to windward and the other cell sheeted off the end of the boom. Um, or you can, if you're reaching, have the cell in uh, code zero mode where you've basically got both cells set together, one inside the other, and it's working as a two ply uh, code zero, um, which is you know, great to be able to do that. That, that just makes us have a real multi-purpose cell. So if you were thinking you wanted a tight reach in Jenica and then another cell to go dead down wind with, then this cell has the ability to do both of those things. Um, so it's a real sort of multi-purpose cell, really. And don't think you need a pole if you've got a catamaran. Uh, here's an example of one uh, taking advantage of the beam. Uh, no main, just tie it off and go. Yeah. Where was this one taken? <laughs> I think that's in the Solent. Uh, you can normally tell Solent pictures. If they look gray and a bit bleak, <laughs> then uh, that's the Solent. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Now you'll notice the, uh, the rope in the middle of the sail in these photos has, you can almost see a crease, uh, not quite here at this angle. It just looks like a white thing. Let's make it a little bigger, see if this works. Oh no, that won't work. Uh, but I think the next one shows, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, I don't know if this is the same boat or a different one, but I, I, I enjoyed seeing this. No, this, this is on the Oyster. This was a little experiment that we were playing with um, on the trade wind sail, and we basically eased the halyard about 30 centimeters. And all of a sudden the sail, the cable that's in the front of the sail wants to fly forward and reduce the, um, the V-ing effect, if you like, between the mm -hmm. two sails. So that's the halyard back on there now. We're just basically pulling the halyard on and off and you'll see in the second there, there's the halyard being released and it's the cable is flying out in front. Nice, stable. And there you go. That's, me, the big, the... that's the big ease on it there now. It's, so it becomes almost one sail. That is nice. The only thing you have to remember to do is to Pull the tackle of the halyard back down again, depending on which one you're adjusting. Because mm -hmm. obviously, the other advantage I see uh, from this sail to some of the other large downwind sails are when you're done, you can, uh, you know, on most boats with an electric winch, push the button, furl it up, and be done with it. Yeah. One of the interesting things to note on that sail is that's actually a polyester sail. And with it being polyester, it's actually got UV protection on there as well. So if you are going downwind for a couple of days on end, but you don't want to have the sail up all the time, or you don't want to be taking the sail down and up, then you can furl it up and, and leave it on the front of the boat, which is really, really nice from a storage point of view. So it's ready to use in, in, in either mode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just like that. Uh, it's fantastic. So, all right. Well, let, let's see what other options we've got. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. This, these are the cards that give us a little bit more of an idea of the, of the wind angles. So it looks like apparent and true, you know, true wind from 150 to 180 when it's deployed in, in trade wind mode. Uh, and then when it's reaching time, uh, true winds 70 to 140. And apparent wind of 60 is, is pretty good, I think, for a lot of boats, especially multi hulls or any of the boats with self tacking jibs that, that really need the extra power up there. Being able to have one sail that takes you in both directions is pretty nice. I've got an interesting question here from Nick Angel, actually, um, on the trade wind sails. And he's asking whether the, the setup encourages the boat to roll because there's no gap between the, the sails. Or, e.g., compare with, with a pulled out jib and a staysail. At least that is what the parasail salespeople are saying. My, my experience is that if you have a mainsail or you have sails that are separated, then the force on each sail is ever so slightly different. And that is what encourages the rolling effect. So the nice thing with the trade wind sail is that it's one sail at the front of the boat and it's almost like it's pulling the boat downwind. Whereas if the mainsail comes into play, there will be load on the mainsail and that will have the effect of sort of loading the boat up a little bit 
and then unloading it as it rolls from one side to the other. So my experience is with the trade wind, don't have a mainsail up, just use the two trade wind sails. Yeah, and I was, I was thinking on that, I think someone else on a, mentioned on another question about having a different size stay sail to the genera. I think if you were on twin head sails, you, yeah, as with this trade wind sail, you kind of want them to be pretty much the same area, those two sails. You, otherwise, if you've got a small stay sail and a big pulled out genera, I, I think that's going to promote more rolling. Whereas if you're symmetrical, you know, and you've got evenly balanced sails one side to the other, then um, I think that will help reduce that as in, you know, as with the trade wind sail, if you've got the trade wind sail, that'll do similar in terms of both sides being symmetrical. But if, you, if you're just using a small stay sail and a, and a large genoa, then I think you'd be a bit unbalanced. Great. All right, we're, uh, we're about a little over a half an hour in. Um, I've got one yeah. more question here whilst we're on the, the trade wind sails, which is an mm -hmm. interesting one. Um, Michael Danielson. He's basically asking, is it better to adjust the tack instead of risking the, easing the, or instead of risking cutting the halib when it's eased, I guess? The problem I found with when you adjust the tack is that the furling drum starts to clang around. Whereas when you ease the halyard, the drum is still fixed to the bowsprit. And from my experience of these, you know, most furling drums need to have an attachment that stops the drum from rotating around. So it needs to have a either a two to one or it clips onto a, an actual pad eye that stops the, the drum being able to do a 360. And, and that's quite critical to the setup. <clears throat> so I, I also, quite like going back to what we said earlier about chafe, chafe on sails is, is bad on the crossing, uh, but also chafe on halyards is really bad. So I think you're going to be wanting to move, move your halyards and maybe even change your halyard if you've got two halyards. Um, you know, fairly regularly just to prevent chafing in exactly the same spot on the halyard the whole time. So maybe easing the halyard one day, maybe a bit of tack line the other day, just keep keep that wear point off being on exactly the same spot in the halyard or the tack line the whole time. It's a good idea. And visit the rigger and get chafe guards on the ends of the halyards so they can yeah. accommodate yeah, this. Good point. idea. Yeah. yeah, so. Okay, more traditionally, downwind spinnakers. Is there still a, still a place for them in the inventory? Jeremy? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, symmetrical spinnakers, you know, been around a long time. Um, still a lot of boats who are sailing across the Atlantic and other long passages are going to be using a spinnaker. It's a very efficient way of getting downwind. Um, it's, it can be a bit harder to use than, um, than the other setups we're talking about in terms of ease of handling. Uh, so you, maybe you need a bit more of an experienced practice crew, especially if you're going to fly in this setup at night in terms of not wrapping it around the force day um, and that sort of thing. But if you have got, you know, practice with it, uh, you know, used to it, then it can be a very effective sail for uh, long downwind passages. You know, it's um, very tried and tested. Most people on a, a cruising voyage would fly a sail like this with a snuffer. You'd have a snuffer on it, a nice little dowser that you can just pull down over it if it gets a bit too windy for the sail, so it's easy to get rid of. Um, so yeah, I think it can be a very effective sail, but you just want to make sure you practice with it and you're comfortable with the conditions that you want to use it in and know, know your limits with it. Great. I know on, on multi-hulls, obviously, poles are not required uh, and you can fly them off the windward hull. Uh, and still sheet it off to the, the leeward rail. And then with a twin sheet and guy set up, jiving the boat's very easy. You, know, you, you pull one, ease the other, turn the boat underneath it, uh, and two people can jive the sail pretty easily, as long as the, the winches are set up properly uh, like that. But for, for deep downwind stuff, that is one advantage that a symmetrical sail on a cat has over an asymmetrical is that repeated jibes are, are less drama. Yeah. All right. Uh, so no surprise. It's primarily a, a deep downwind sail uh, you know, heading heading like that uh, and very lightweight, probably a little better in the very light stuff as well because of the sail material. Yeah. And you yeah. can you can reach tighter than that, but that, that's it's generally a downwind sail. But yeah. So. Jennikers and snuffers. 
Uh, let me see. We got a little bit. Yeah, another fun video. Good. <laughs> yeah, so this is a very common, you know, very, um, again, lots of boats will have a, a sail like this when they um, cross Atlantic or other oceans. Um, an asymmetrical Jenica in a, in a snuffer, a dowser, like that little bucket that comes down over the sail. It's you know very a very common setup and, and very you know very nice sort of easy to use setup as well. Um, the cells like this tend to be you know relatively full, so they're designed for um, sailing as off the wind as possible uh, with an asymmetrical sail. So the luff will roll out to windward, and you'll be able to sort of sail a relatively low angle down to sort of one sixty true wind angle, something like that. And then if you're reaching up to as tight as you know, 120 or 115 true wind angle, and depending on the wind conditions. Um, because they're a deeper sail, you know, deep design for running, they're not really able to be furled. Um, so that is, that's why you're seeing this sail used with a with a dowser, with a stuffer. Great. That's also, I know, in terms of people trying to get into a downwind sail on a budget, a Jenica with a snuffer is usually the, uh, the simplest way. Uh, and the components cost less compared to anything involving furling. Uh, and if you have a little discipline on uh, the wind conditions that you'll use it in, um, snuffing it uh, is pretty easy. I, I have heard horror stories of people who wait too long uh, to get it down. That's when a snuffer can, can really start to get your attention. You got to go forward on the foredeck. Uh, and while you're up there, you know, hopefully someone else is steering and, and can be up or down a little bit, depending on how the sail's behaving. Um, in, in inclement weather, or if you're not familiar with it, uh, a, a snuffer is a challenge that, that needs to be practiced. Um, but uh, in conditions like in this video right here, uh, no, it's a breeze. I'm still amazed at how well that went up, that, that the snuffer went to the top and the thing goes poof like that. So uh, I think the person on the helm knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a, yeah, just again, it's just, as well as if you have this on board, just get some good practice with it, and um, then you won't have any problems. Once you know, you, you shouldn't have many problems once you've practiced with it, got used to how to douse it, and the conditions you're happy with it in. Then, so um, how many friends do you need to to practice? I mean, I think they only had what twenty or thirty people on on this boat. Yeah, it depends how big your sail is. So this is a this is effectively the same sort of sail. It's on a snuffer, but this is the largest sail um, single sail ever made. Uh, Two thousand. 600 square meters square meters i think yeah just over 2600 square meters Where, where's peter Grimm? he's on the chat drop something in there Grimmy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah these cells come in all shapes and sizes but as you can see especially in that right hand photo you know left hand photo they're reaching a little bit with it and the right hand photo they're running nice and deep and the luffs rolling out to windward um it's, it's exactly the same cells in the previous um video but just a lot, lot bigger. Nice, nice, amazing stuff. This, this was just flown for the first time. Uh, what was it about a month and a half ago? Uh, and uh, yeah, went up and worked just like it would on a forty footer. So, took a little longer to get to the top though. Yeah. So, okay. In general, again, we've got uh, wind angles. You can get it. A little higher, a little lower. Uh, these do come in, in some different shapes and sizes. Uh, they, they can be they can be used uh, across a pretty wide wind wind range. Uh, however, uh, which is which is great and part of the reason they've been so popular. The designs have been optimized to be able to go high, go low, uh, and, and try and do uh, uh, as, as much as one sail can really. Um, now it still has some limits. Um, uh, ultimately, I know in the world of, of North Sales, we've got an all-purpose Jenniker, which is usually favoring the high side a little bit. Uh, and then we've got a deep running sail. But recently, we've developed one that tries to combine a number of different features uh, of our Jennikers like that, uh, the Helix Furling Jenniker. Um, which you guys would like to explain this one to everybody? Do you want to do it on now? Yeah, so um, the Helix Furling Jenica, the idea with this sail is to try and make the handling of the sail as easy as possible while still getting some reasonable downwind angles. Um, so we've basically tried to have it without a snuffer. 
and then we've tried to make it as full as possible. Now that the key to making this sale work is what we call top down furling. That means that when you pull the furling lines at the bottom, the cable at the bottom of the sail and the tack basically stays stationary. Sorry. And the cable spins and spins and spins. And after maybe 30 seconds of pulling, all of a sudden the, the sail starts to wrap from the top down, hence top down furling. Um, and this basically provides a very, very secure furl so that when you hoist and drop the sail, there's very little risk of the, the head of the sail unraveling. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of you will have seen people sailing around with partially unfurled and furled sails or horrible wine glass effects on them. And that's because they're not top down furling, they're what we call bottom up. And the top of the sail is unraveled in one direction and the bottom is trying to unravel in the other. So bottom up, Bottom up furling is definitely to be avoided on cruising sails. And the, the top down is, is where this sort of sail evolved from. Then we've, we've tried to make the sail basically as big as possible. Now you'll see this, this picture here is a picture of a catamaran and a catamaran ha needs, has a different requirement to a monohull. So on, on a lot of the oysters I've done recently, we, we make this sail at a sort of 65, 68, 70% mid-width, which allows the sail to be fuller and it makes it a very good downwind or downwind-ish sail. It gets you down to about 135, 140 true wind angle. But at the same time, the sail is flat enough that it will also do 80 or 90 degrees true wind angle in the light airs. So you can see it's a very versatile sail. Um, you see in the picture on the left, there's it's Two, two shades. So the front of the sail is made out of a heavier material than the back of the sail. And the idea behind that is, and no doubt you'll have read some of this in yachting magazines about load sharing. And basically we bring some of the load that is in the front of the cable back into the sail. And again, this allows this or encourages the sail to fly with a straighter luff. So that allows you to get deeper angles downwind, which is, is again, is crucial. If that sail drops off to leeward and hides behind the mainsail, then it's going to encourage you to basically put the bow up another 10, 15 degrees in order to fill it again. Whereas this sail, <clears throat> you can see here, is sitting very nicely on the centre line with a very straight luff. I, I love these sails. They're, they're my favourite cruising sails now. This is what I call code zero mode with the halyard pulled kind of tight, the sailing and kind of high, uh, and, and just, just humming along. Um, uh, nice image there. This is a client of mine actually on a, on a privilege. Um, the more people that get drones and know how to fly them while they're sailing, the, the more happy sailmakers become because they send back pictures like this and they're just wonderful. Uh, he is reaching a little deeper and if you'll see, he has eased off the halyard. Uh, when you ease the halyard in these sails, it really transform from a tighter, flatter Code Zero style sail into an actual cruising Jenniker. Uh, ease the halyard, ease the sheet. The sail rotates out further from behind the mainsail, uh, and and you've got a deep sailing sail uh, that is very powerful. Uh, and when you pull the halyard back up and furl it. It goes away. I've got a question here that's coming on the chat that's saying basically no pole needed. And that, that's right. So this sail basically sits on the center line of the boat with a furling gear. Yeah. And the good thing about these sails, what I've found is that it took like they were tending to make them in polyester, or we are making them in polyester. And as Neil mentioned earlier in the trade wind one, that does mean, as in this photo we're looking at here, that you can put a UV strip on it. So you can see it's like a slightly different shade on the foot and the leech of this sail. And that is a, a lightweight UV strip. So you can tighten the hide on this sail and fill it up. And you haven't got to rush to get it down to get it out of the, you know, the sun. You can leave it up there while you have lunch or, you know, for the day. And it's not going to, um, not going to get damaged like it would if it was a, a pure nylon sail without a UV strip on it. 
This is a Saba 50 at the dock and the gray sail is the furled Helix furling Jenniker. Uh, in fact, if you look at the top, you see what Neil was talking about, the secure furl at the head. When it starts turning up here first, uh, it is really snug, very tight up here. And then if anything, it's a little looser at the bottom, but that's just not even an issue on this one. No, because it's tight there. Uh, but it can just live there. Uh, that, that's what you get with top down furling, right, Bob? Yep. Yes, indeed. No, that's nice. In fact, just as an aside, if anyone's having difficulty with their existing code zero that is bottom up furling and you've got the room for it, um, you might try the little adapter. See the tack adapter in here? It, it sits between the furler and the rope in the sail. Uh, for five or 800 bucks or so, uh, you can most likely turn a bottom up furling code zero into a top down furling code zero if you've got the room for it. You're adding five or eight inches or so, assuming this the it's not close to max, that would solve a, a, an opening problem uh, up top and just a little uh, public service announcement there. And one thing we normally do on those sales, which you just saw in that photo, we, we put a, a Velcro on the, on the clue as well. So when it's filled up, the Velcro hits itself and um, that, that keeps them together. Yeah, you can see a little bit of poking out there. Yeah. So that is, is pretty nice and secure once it's rolled away. And since we're just you know throwing out ideas on, on, on these, the other thing, this is a better zoom. What I also tell people to do, when you can reach your bowsprit, uh, and sometimes you can, it's just not worth it. Uh, the ultimate protection about a furler like this coming unfurled, take a soft shackle and just weave it through the spinning parts uh, of the furler so that even if you started yanking on the sheet, that's just not gonna spin. Uh, and if you're going to bed at night and you want ultimate security, knowing you're not gonna wake up to the sound of a flapping sail, uh, that, that helps you sleep better. So, okay, so that's the Helix Furling Janiker. Uh, oh, even more, good. We've got some videos, yeah. Some yeah, videos for, of it. we got to save the good stuff for, for, for the, the last part. Yeah, so these sales, again, like, it's not like one sale design for everything. We, we do customize the design, obviously, for each boat, but also for what the customer wants. So we can make this type of sails, you know, smaller and flatter for more reaching, or we can make it, you know, fuller and deeper as more of a, a running sail. So within a certain parameters, we can we can adjust the design depending on what different boats want to do. Yeah, I know. Uh, how deep can it be before it can't carry a sun cover anymore? I'm not sure about that, Bob. I think, I, I think we're. We've experimented now and are producing a deeper, wider sail, the easy furl Jenniker, um, and I, that is a, a very deep downwind sail, but we had to give up the sun cover. You still keep the convenience of the internal furling cable, uh, but get even a, a, a deeper downwind range with it uh, at the cost of uh, the sun cover, just because it, that there's so much shape in the back like that. Yeah, I think that's actually more a combination of the fact that as you want the sail to go deeper, there's less load on the sail and the, the sun cover, basically the weight of it is call it three ounce, um, unless it's painted on, but um, the weight of the, the UV on, on the sail basically creates the sail to collapse. So a lot of that really depends on the boat size. Obviously, the bigger the boat, the less effect the UV has on there, but on a, on a small boat, then uh, yeah, for sure, it's a, it's a bit of a problem. Okay. Oh, and here's furling. One thing I would recommend to everyone is, uh, this guy in the bow that's pulling this with his hands, um, there's a new invention called an electric winch, uh, whenever <laughs> possible. <laughs> lead the furling line to the electric winch and there's lots of little doodads and gizmos to take it back there safely yeah if you have one they're, they're good things to have for sure but yeah. to be fair these these sails are not yeah then none of these sort of furling sails these days if you have a good cable and in the lap of the sail they, they furl away really nicely i think i think that one by hand was 27 seconds looking at the time clip at the bottom that's pretty good based and that's on a 48 footer 
So you can see the sail rolling from the top down and it basically gets easier and easier and easier. The, the first five or six pulls of the hard bit. Very nice. Do you know if that, that one had a, a rope or a cable? That's a cable. That's got the helix cable in there. That's great. No, that, the luff length on that sail is, I think, 21 meters. So that basically gets a, a proper cable. Excellent. So, all right, moving along. This we thought was a nice little <clears throat> illustration. Uh, approximate usage angles for the, the, the G0, a typical code zero, a deep sailing G2, uh, kind of an all purpose Jenniker in the middle like that. And then a, a glimpse at how the helix Jenniker spans the wind angle ranges, although it is, uh, since it's a heavier sail with a sun cover, it's probably not quite as good in the, the lower wind speed ranges like that. Uh, but if you're, when you know that and you combine it with the convenience of being able to furl the thing and make it go away, uh, it's proven to be a very popular sail. In fact, I think last year, North Sails sold more of this, the Helix Jenniker, than it did of either of, or any of the other single alternatives like that. Yeah. And we call these sort of grass loads that don't have, they're like a polar polar diagram. So it's just showing you, you know, the wind speed that you, we generally recommend to use these sails in and, and then the wind angles on the, um, that, that you get to with these sails. And it just sort of shows you how the different design sails that we can do suit, you know, that their ideal area suits a different sort of wind speed and, and angle. Um, but there are quite a few crossovers between these different designs. Then last, I think we wanted to touch on, uh, you know, not make this exclusively a downwind sail option uh, presentation. We obviously got into that, into the detail, and, and we won't get into too much detail on these, but really just to open the door in case there are questions uh, or uh, for a potential follow-up uh, webinar if people are interested. Uh, we wanted to just briefly discuss the evolution of sailcloth, of upwind sailcloth specifically like this. You know, where it started when, when Neil said, Neil, evidently everything was cross-cut. I'm, I'm glad to hear cotton had faded out by the time that, uh, that you were doing that, though. So that, that's got to be a, a plus. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, no, good job that... Um... Uh, cotton had gone that's for sure in fact it's, it's quite interesting my my first month at north sales back in 1982 we built a, a mainsail for condor the, the super maxi and in order for that to be strong enough it had to be three ply dacron um so it was three layers of i think it was seven ounce dacron and then around the reefs there was a fourth layer inside the sail and yeah it was it was mind-blowing for a First month at work, it was crazy. Yeah. So crosscut led to panel laminates in a radial fashion. Well, what was the, the first material you remember using there? Um, radials was an interesting one. So those of you remember the Australia to America's Cup, that's where we first started seeing people turning what was standard sailcloth around the other way and building what was then we called leech cut sails. Um, and that was basically just utilizing the stronger direction of the fabric and trying to align it better with the load. And the, the leech cut wasn't that successful, although it did win the America's Cup. But um, tri-radial is all about, again, aligning the strong fabric fiber in the fabric to the loads within the sail. So the loads come out of the clue, radiate out of the clue up to the head, and they come out the tack and radiate up to the head. So you can see there in that panel layout, they're trying to match the loads within the sail. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's very early engineering, um, but it is an important part of sail making and how the sails are made. And yeah, you know, as we go on now, further and further, moving on from the, the laminates, we ended up with what we call the string sails or we we called it 3dl and this was a custom made one piece sail with the again the fibers matching the loads and rather than taking a 
panel of sailcloth and cutting it up into lots of different panels and then sticking those panels together. This is one continuous fiber of string running from head to tack, tack to clue, around the reefs, wherever we needed the, the reinforcement. Um, the big problem with the string sails, and it still is a problem with them today, is in order to make a string sail, you have to use a glue that is uh, basically heat set. So you lay the fibers down and they are tacky, and then you heat them up with a, either a lamp or whatever you want to use to heat the glue up to a certain temperature. It melts and basically bonds the sail together when it, when it dries and, and cures and, and cools. Um, everyone thought, yeah, great, perfect. And we built many, many, many sails in 3DL. But the one problem we had was the, the hot melt glue. So this is where 3DI basically stepped away from what we've been doing traditionally. And it basically uses what we call a thermoset glue, or more, it's more of a resin than a glue. So it's a, again, it is a heat reaction that sets the glue off. But once it has been cured, it is cured. A little bit like boat building. You know, your boats are built using resin infusion or something like that. There's a catalytic effect that cures the resin and that's the, the resin cured. And it's the same with 3DI. And, that, and that's the biggest change that we've seen in cell making, certainly in my lifetime. It, it's scary. You know, I never saw, thought we'd see Dacron one-piece sails for small boats, but um, we, we're seeing it now. So, yeah, that like was... you say, Bob, there's there's probably a whole whole other talk in uh, sailcloth and different you know cloths for your upwind sails. Um, and as Neil was saying, the 3DI is particularly good in the tropics and in in warm areas where you get the sails are going to get very hot. Uh, if you want a low stretch to a high performance sail um, that's not got any real risk of delamination, then the 3DI is, is great in those climates. Uh, oh, but again, if you're on a budget and you want a super durable sail, then the Crosscut Dacron, again, yeah, doesn't hold the best shape in the long term, but super, super durable. Well, I'll go further. I think a lot of the people that will be uh, in this webinar, low stretch is nice, uh, lightweight is nice. Uh, but ultimately it's how long is this thing going to last uh, so I can keep sailing? Uh, and that's what has continued to impress me about the, the 3DIs is by not being a mylar laminate like that, uh, it doesn't suffer from the common delamination you see in, in other sails. Uh, and it's, it's been wonderful on big cats, big boats, living in the Caribbean, uh, and just great stuff. This was what we prepared, uh, and we hope you got a lot out of it. We'll, we'll stick around for questions if people have that. We would love to know uh, in your comments uh, if there are other areas of this you'd like to see future webinars about. Uh, it, we like doing it. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, we can put some prep into it and, and, and go off in another direction if, if something else uh, is, is valuable to you. So, so please chime in and, and let us know that too. Um, Thanks, Bob. Got a question from Ellen again. Where does Dyneema fit in sail type? Um, Jeremy, you want to explain the the role yeah, of so Dyneema? Dyneema um, we've got it in our range of cloth. You know, Dyneema would be what we call MPL tour. So a tri, and that's our that's a triradial cut sail. So the ones you're looking at there, second from the left hand side, that's a triradial cut sail. Um, and Dyneema is a you know, a cruising laminate in Dyneema is a great option for uh, extended cruising, you know, with a, a low stretch, um, a low stretch sailcloth. Um, it's going to really good, you're resistant to UV degradation, really good with flex fatigue. Um, and it's just a really nice fiber uh, for making, you know, cruising laminate sails out of for, for long passages. Um, and as in the 3D ice, I mean, Dyneema is just the fiber rather than, you know, we use Dyneema in the 3D ice sails as well. Um, it's just a really good fiber for cruising with. You know, it's very, very good, uh, low stretch, good UV resistance. So it really lends itself to, you know, offshore cruising in, in hot climates. Very resistant to chafe as well, which is good. Yeah. yeah and, definitely. and my favorite part is the flex fatigue. You know, anyone who's tried to break a credit card or 
see a flag at a car dealership understands what flex is going to do to a material, it's going to weaken it. Uh, Dyneema's capability of resisting flex fatigue is, is better than most, which is why it's an excellent fiber for a cruising sail. Uh, carbon's tough. Carbon's kind of the opposite in flex fatigue. It's very brittle. Uh, and while you could pull on it all day long, if you fold it a whole lot, it's going to break down. Uh, so when you hear someone talking about carbon in their cruising sails, uh, you want to know what else is in there as well, because ultimately that carbon is going to break and it's up to the other fibers uh, to, to do the job. So that's why until you get into the race side of things in 3DI, um, we just don't use carbon, uh, except for the, you know, the high end when performance is the priority, uh, because the Dyneema does such a great job. There's a question in the chat box here from Raphael about, um, well, two points really, which material is in 3DI? Which, you know, which fibers 3DI cells made of, and also is Dacron still uh, advised for cruisers? It's, it's an interesting one. So 3DI, when we first started doing 3DI, it was only available in, in the, well, well, we can use multiple of materials in there, but it, 3DI on day one was what we call the endurance product. The endurance product was um, Aramid and Spectra. And then as it evolved a little bit more and a little bit more, we, we've added carbon and we've also added polyester. So different sales, different numbers. If you have a look at a 3DI sale, it'll have a number. So it starts off at um, 300 and then it goes 360 and then 700. Then, yeah, there we go. 700, 370. That, and that basically tells you what the material in the sale is. So a seven is Ultra PE, Spectra or Dyneema. That's all sort of the, the same sale. A six is um, Aramid. So we don't actually have a three, a 760 there, which is what the original um, 3DI was. Um, so from a cruising, cruising point of view, what we want to have is seven, which is Spectra. And if you want to go a little bit higher performance, then go 760, which it has some Aramid in there. Then if you want to have a sale that is all purpose, a little bit racing and cruising, 780 is an option, but that is more of a racing orientated sale rather than a durable sale. I think if you're going across Atlantic, specifics, et cetera, then the, the ocean product is definitely my first choice. And that is a, a Spectra or Dyneema or Ultra PE, which is all the, the same fiber. Um, and that is, it's incredible. Um, I had a guy yesterday on the phone who was just buying a new oyster and he got his, in fact, he was a customer of Peter Grimm's, and um, he was saying that his current Spectra sales, which he's raced with extensively, were seven years old and still going strong, still really nice, still really happy with them. And he basically isn't going anywhere. He was actually trying to persuade me not to sell him the Ocean product because of his experience with the uh, endurance product. But... Uh, I think the Ocean 700 is still the best product for him. Yeah. Uh, I think for most people on this call, Ocean 700, Ocean 370 is, is a great option. And the smaller boats, the Ocean 330, which is We're a, seeing a here, term. the Ocean 700 is described as Ultra PE and the Aramid, which is just like the Endurance. I think it's important to point out the, in the design process for these, the ratio of these fibers, the amount of the, the fiber tapes that get put into the sail changes uh, based on uh, the boat, uh, the intended use, the aspect ratio of the sail. So an ocean sail, while it's described as both, it's going to have a much higher ratio of the Dyneema, the Ultra PE, than it will over the Aramid. Whereas on the endurance side, the Aramid is a little lower stretch. So when performance is, uh, is more of a goal, uh, Aramid is going to be favored, specifically more up the leech uh, where the higher loads are. Um, it, this gets into way over my head, the design tools that the teams use uh, to address elongation loads under strain and then compression loads when the sails trying to squish back together. 
Um, that's the true magic of 3 di is they can put the fibers that serve the specific purpose in that area of the sale uh, and, and not have to have other fibers that, that aren't doing that job. Um, we've got all sorts of fun digital tools we can show off uh, to dive deeper into that sometimes. And we, maybe there's a, a, a webinar that'll, that'll feature some of the designers showing off their, their stuff. Right. I'm looking for my, my, my question uh, window. I think I buried it. What else do we need to look at? I think there was a question on Dacron. Is it still good for cruising? I mean, I would say it's still a great fiber for cruising with, especially uh, you know, on, on, small, on smaller boats, maybe 40 foot and under. If you're looking for durability and you, you know, on a, um, especially if you're on a bit of a budget, wanting to keep the cost down, then Dacron is, cross cut Dacron is still a really durable sale. What do you guys think? I, I think it's like a, obviously the price point can't be ignored. Uh, there is such a global market for polyester in general, the polyester fibers are cheaper. Uh, the weaving is long established. I think a lot of the looms that are still in use from the, the 70s and 80s are still going strong. Um, so the, the, the price on woven polyester is great. The thing I think people forget is if they got a brand new boat and they've got Dacron sails and they've got a nice little Yanmar diesel and they've got that diesel going and they're out in the first year of the boat, they're looking, you know, we're, what do you cruise at? Oh, we cruise at about 2,800 RPMs. You know, and that's going to do about you know six knots like that. Well, if later on something you, know, you notice that the engine you need more RPMs to do that same six knots, and the bottom's still clean, uh, and it's it's working harder to do the same thing, you're going to notice. You're going to notice in the tachometer something's wrong. You, know, you need engine service because this shouldn't be that way. You don't notice it on Dacron. Dacron from day one, it starts stretching. Um, and the airplane wing that is designed for maximum efficiency on the boat degrades over time because the, the fibers themselves stretch and then the weave loosens up. Um, you get two, three years into the sail and it's like the boiling frog analogy. You don't really notice that it's been, it's been going away. Now, now people who track the, their, their plots and their angles to the wind, yep, they'll, they'll notice where you used to be pointing at you know, 37, 40, you know, a parent angle when you're going close all and suddenly you're you're just not really doing that anymore uh and you, the sales can't get you that high so while they'll still be lasting in five six seven years um you're not going to have the uh the upwind pointing ability when the boat gets a gust it's not going to be converted into thrust as efficiently uh, boats can heal over more um and while they're still there, they're not doing the job they were uh, in the beginning. Uh, that's been the goal of the evolution of upwind sails is take the design and keep it there. Keep the shape of the airplane wing uh, the way it's intended to be. So uh, DAC runs great. Just understand what you're getting and that over time, uh, it's, it's going to fade. I think, I think the other thing just to bear in mind with DAC on these days is yeah, it wasn't that long ago you could buy a 10, 11, 12 ounce Decron and that those heavy fabrics have disappeared now. And typically a heavy Decron is maybe seven ounce, eight ounce, which again limits the boat size. So as Jeremy said, sort of 40 foot and under, great, but um, don't expect it to be performing on a 60 footer. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. I think we're, um, we're kind of there, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. Um, the last page, of course, as promised, is contact info. Um, you can clip it, snip it, or get in touch with us later on uh, uh, if you've got more questions uh, that we need to answer. Uh, we hope you got something out of this. Um, Neil, anything left or Jeremy? No, I think there's, there's one very good question here that Michael's asked on Michael Danielson which is basically why North Sales no longer does 3DL. And the, in, the issues with aramid, with creep in sandwich laminate, especially in the tropics. Well, the tropics and 3DL basically didn't go together. Um, and that's the same with any string sale. And it comes back to the glue that is used in the laminate. Um, it's a hot melt, so you heat it up. 
and it slowly gets tackier and tackier and tackier and then eventually it will delaminate through that process the fibers that are inside the sail typically hydroscopically soak up water moisture so the window that they are sitting in all of a sudden gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger the sail cools the glue reattaches itself turns itself back to a proper glue but 3di basically doesn't have that problem so that's the reason that we got rid of 3dl and we've gone and stuck with 3di it's purely because it the lamination process for 3di is so much better than any other string sale it's not true jeremy any um, morning thoughts no just to thank everyone that attended um it's great uh, we had so many people online um thanks very much for coming and listening to us and yeah, if anyone's got any questions after this, then feel free to contact us on these numbers um, or we can put you in touch with you know, many other local North Sales guys and girls around the world who are all here to help. I just want to say thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge uh, with us. It's been fascinating to, to hear it from the experts. Um, apologies if we didn't get around to answering your specific question. We will. I've made a copy of any unanswered questions and we'll pass it around the guys try and get them back in time for, for the follow-up tomorrow. So we'll email you the uh, contact links for the presenters and the watch again link for the video. So great, really appreciate you giving up time to join us tonight. And thank you very much to everyone in the room for coming to watch. So it just leaves it for me to say goodbye. Uh, Godspeed, safe, sa safe sailing, and we'll see you again online soon. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks Jeremy. Bye.